Good day, race fans! I'm Unsilent, and we're on the air with more Grand Prix 2, the 1996 F1 sim of the 1994 Formula 1 World Championship season. Developed by Jeff Cram and published by Microprose Games, we've reached round number 10 of the Formula 1 World Championship for 1994. And that brings us to Hungary, the Hungaro Ring for the Magyar Negidij, the Hungarian Grand Prix. The Hungaro Ring just outside of Budapest, so it's a favorite of some of the drivers because it's a nice atmosphere around there in the city. But uh, in terms of racing, the fans, uh, they can leave it most of the time. The Hungaro Ring really hasn't changed that much between 1994 and 2017. So the race if you saw a couple of weeks ago for Formula One for the 2017 Hungarian Grand Prix, not a lot of action in that one. And uh, well, you know what? That's because this isn't a passing friendly track. The only really good passing zone is right down into turn one along that front straight. If you can uh, get a good run out of the final hairpin and down into turn one, maybe just maybe it's turn four with a little bit of luck. That's at the end of the straight with the arrow next to it. And then maybe just maybe on the far side, on the opposite side of the track, you've got that short little straight into a tight 90 degree right hander. If you're really, really daring, you can make a pass into there. But the idea here is track position, track position, track position. And that is the key to success at the Hungaro ring then and now as we go on to track position. Well... Could you call a points lead like David Coulthard has track position? It's sort of the same thing. A 33-point lead in the world driver standings over Michael Schumacher. Could you say this championship is done and dusted at the moment? Well, at the top, maybe. Schumacher, Lacey, and Hill, 2-3-4, separated top to bottom by just six points. So that is really tight, and that's a battle worth watching for the rest of the season. Another one worth watching. Myself is Eddie Irvine, just three points ahead of Gerhard Berger, who's in six. So the battle for top five is also well in hand. And you should go down the list. Kariyama Barrichello. Panis moves to P9 after his result in the last race. Hakkinen's got to get by him. On to the World Constructors' Championship. Even less to talk about here because Williams has doubled up on Ferrari. So, yeah, that one is also done. Chases to see whether Benetton can get ahead of Ferrari if Schumacher can power his way ahead of Alessi and Berger in the two Scuderia Ferrari factory cars and whether Ligier, after their four-point performance in Germany, can hold off McLaren for sixth place in the World Constructors' Championship over the final seven Grand Prix of the season. On to Friday qualifying. Not a lot of qualifying highlights, so we're going to do one lap. This is my fast lap of qualifying on both Friday and Saturday. It just so happens to be from Friday qualifying down to turn two. No DRS in 1994, so not a lot of passing was happening down here in 1994. A little more since the introduction of DRS nowadays. We go up to turn four. That is where Jacques Villeneuve got by Damon Hill to win the 1997 Hungarian Grand Prix, though Hill had a problem, a wounded car with bad hydraulics in his arrows, which is what allowed Villeneuve by him there. As we go into this tight and twisty middle sector, it's single file. You have to make a mistake in order to let someone by, but uh, there's really not a lot of pressure because that's the, you have to make a mistake for someone to go by. That was the passing that I was talking about earlier. That right-hander there as we come into the second-to-last corner. Not a lot of passing here or here to the final corner, but a good exit here means everything for the next lap, especially down to that first turn. As we come across the line, we go from P6 to P1 with a 122-119. This was my Monaco setup, just lightly modified to go around the Hungaro ring, and sure did seem to work a pole there and a pole here, but we've got to watch out for the race is outbreaking myself where there isn't a marker board to know where your breaking point is, and auto spin curves as well. Auto spin curves are plenty on this version of Grand Prix 2. And tire wear. These were my tires after 19 laps. That's also the Grand Prix distance. Uh, basically worn through the left front tire. A lot of wear on the left front tire. And uh, my goodness, if I don't have any grip on the left front, I don't have any speed through the turns. That'll certainly make me very vulnerable for overtaking attempts going into that first turn. 
So having to take care of the tires will be a priority for me in this race if I want to contend. But on to the starting grid for the Hungarian Grand Prix. In Grand Prix 2, one quarter distance, 19 laps. I'm on pole as Eddie Irvine, one second ahead of Michael Schumacher in the Benetton Ford. David Coulthard in P3 and the Williams alongside Mika Hacken in the McLaren Peugeot. That's his best starting position of the season. He needs to convert that into a good finish in order to get he and his team ahead of Olivier Panis and the Ligier Renault team in the World Constructors Championship. Row 3, it's Damon Hill in the second Williams and alongside him is Jean Lacy in the first of the Scuderia Ferraris. Ukio Kadayama in P7, well we know he's good in tight and twisty circuits in the Tyrrell Yamaha. He was second at the Pacific Grand Prix at Ada. And then, I, my speed's not much of a fluke, Rubens Barrichello in position number 8 and second, Jordan Hart. A good qualifying for Johnny Morbidelli in the footwork Ford. He's in position number 9, hoping he can get some points in this race. And alongside Gerhard Berger, who's right behind me in the World Drivers' standings in P10. Pierre Luigi Martini in the first of the Minardi Fords on the inside of row six. And alongside him, the Sauber Mercedes of Andrea Cesar, some marked improvement from his German Grand Prix form. Johnny Herbert, he's OP in position number 12, but he's starting in 13th here. Michele Alboreto, right behind his teammate in P14 in the second minority. Mark Blundell, a little behind his teammate, but not too bad in P15. And Eric Coma in P16 in the first of the La Russe Fords. There. Olivier Panis, not repeating his German Grand Prix form. He's starting from P17, not likely to reach the points from there. He hides Harold Frenson in the second of the Sauber Mercedes. Martin Brundle, well back of his teammate. He's teammate of Hackenden's in P4. And Martin is in P19. Yoss Verstappen, even farther back of his teammate. 18 spots behind Schumacher, who's in P2. Yoss is starting from the outside of row number 10. That means he's position number 20 at the start. Christian Fittipaldi, we're used to seeing him back here in row number 11 and alongside Eric Bernard in second of the Ligiers. He picked up a point in the last race. I don't think he's going to repeat this time out. Alex Nardi in the second of the Lotus Mugen Hondas. He is in P23 alongside Olivier Beretta in the second of the LaRousse Fords. Both those guys are going to have better runs elsewhere outside of Formula 1. And on the back row, David Brabham, the Simtech Ford. And stop me if you've heard this before. Jean-Paul Belmondo, shotgun on the field, starting in position number 26. The warning horn goes. The engines come to life. It's race time in Grand Prix 2 for red lights. Four to six seconds. The revs come up and green, green, green for the Hungarian Grand Prix. And a blistering start by Mika Hakkinen as we charge down into turn one. And oh, chaos already as I've gone to the back of Schumacher. Ender breaking to turn one. And I'm just losing all the positions in the world. I fall back to P21. And then as the field checks up into turn two, I run into the back of, I believe that was Coma and the LaRousse. As we take a look at the replay of the start just now, you can see Hackett get his good start. Schumacher and Hill, th too wide rather, as Schumacher forces me out under braking onto the grass and I lose control. Schumacher comes across and cuts off a lane under braking that I would have had and I was planning to use the big beneficiary, Johnny Morbidelli, goes from P9, gets two positions on the start and to break it into turn one and two because of the wreck, so he's up to P5 off the start. So it's time for a comeback underneath the Verstappen for P number 20. And then on the front straight, we're going to get by Eric Coma, and we're going to get by Eric Bernard, and then, well, sorry, Heinz, and into the back of Heinz Harold France and into turn one and three on the front straight right there. As we come up to Olivier Beretta and the other of the LaRusses and all oh, running into the back of him into turn five. Not used to being in this much slower traffic. I've got a really good car, but unfortunately, it's a lot better than everyone else. At the end of that lap, we're coming up behind Frenson as his car breaks in the final turn. And we're right into the back of him. He had a puncture and uh, couldn't get to the pits and decided to just park it on the apex in front of everyone and try and ruin my day and Schumacher right behind him as well. Lap number four, we're charging up behind Verstappen again as we're making up ground yet again. As we look up the inside, we had no place to go but there because Verstappen basically parked it on the apex of that second to last turn, so I go for a spin. 
We're going to next lapper to go by Versapid again. And auto spin curb on the inside. I've been making that turn at that speed all weekend long, but except there where I have no room but on the curb there. But we do eventually get Verstappen a couple laps later as we dive up the inside of him there, force him a little wide. A lovely little setup, just outbreak him there, and then, well, Verstappen outbroke himself trying to hold on to that position and found himself in the gravel. Lap number seven, we're trying to look for some clear air to get by everyone. And we're going to go up the inside of the LaRousse there, and now we're going to go up next to the Ligier there, too, on the front straight, under braking into turn one. As we take a look at the replay, it's a very aggressive cut into turn one to make sure I have that inside line underneath the Ligier. And that gives me some clean air, and I'm able to set the fastest lap of the race with a 25-5. We're trying to mow down the leaders. Can we do anything at the halfway point of this race? Lap 10. And chaos in front of me that I didn't cause this time. It's Brundle and the McLaren, uh, Panis and the Leash and Schumacher, and Brundle's out. Here's what happened following Panis. He has to take evasive maneuvers of a slow and broken McLaren as he goes wide. Brundle just parks it on the apex, and Panis has to go evasive maneuvers into the gravel and grass, and that sends his car for a spin. The problem with Brundle is just along the straight he had a suspension failure and unfortunately parked it on the apex, causing all sorts of chaos behind him. Schumacher hit him, Panis had to go spinning, and I managed to just break in time. Up the inside of Alboreto as we continue our charge. We did lose a lot of time on Schumacher there, trying to get back up to speed after that, and he had clean air. Get up the inside of the Chesers here with two to go. One more look at that. A little bump as we go for the little same piece of real estate, but uh, I was able to agricultural race my buddy by him. And now up the inside of Johnny Herbert in car number 12, the uh, Lotus, and that would do it for P11. But after the race, I give Michael a piece of my mind. He did cut me off under braking. And, uh, well, Sebastian Vettel would certainly complain about that sort of movement out of him. But here are the race results for the Hungarian Grand Prix. David Coulthard wins yet again. I believe this is like, what, his uh, fifth race in a row that he's won. I think seventh overall. So he's well and truly ahead of everyone. 16 seconds ahead of Hill. Jean Lacy and Pete number three. Mika Hakkinen finishes fourth. His best result of the season. That'll move him ahead of Ligier and Panis in the Constructors and Drivers Championships, respectively. Johnny Morbidelli held on to P5, and that's points. First points for the season for Morbidelli and Footwork Ford. And Gerhard Berger in sixth trims my lead over him by one more point. As we on, go on down the standings, Michael Schumacher recovered to P9. He was behind me after the first turn. Pierre Luigi Martini, not a bad result for him in the minority in P10. I managed to make my way up to, as I said, P11. Not a bad result, but considering I was starting on pole, I definitely should have been contending for a win. Could I have kept up with Coulthard? No, well, maybe, but I definitely think I could have kept him behind me. And on back to the second page of results as we go on down Belmondo with a good result ahead of Brabham, P22 and 23 respectively, and then are your three retirements. Rundle we saw, Frenson we saw, and Mark Blundell was also ahead of me, but he had a transmission failure and was able to successfully get out of the way of everyone and pull off to the side without intervening in everyone's race. The World Drivers' Championship, David Coulthard extends his lead even more, double points over Jean Alessi, who's one point ahead of Schumacher, who is level on points with Hill, it's one point separating second through fourth. Also a battle for fifth, as I'm only two points ahead of Gerhard Berger, so it's all to play for in the top six of the championship, well, second through sixth anyway. So we go on back, Hakkinen's moved up to eighth in the championship, ahead of Barrichello, and most importantly, Pennis. Johnny Morbidelli, the 13th point scorer of the season, he vaults up in into position number 11 in the World Driver Standings table after 10 rounds. He's looking pretty good there, to say safely there, with six rounds left in the 1994 World Championship season. On to the World Constructors Championship table. Again, doubling up on Ferrari, it's Williams on the power of Coulthard and Hill, so they're safely there. They haven't clinched it, but effectively have clinched the Constructors title. Ferrari extends its lead over Benetton. I think we're safe then fourth as Jordan, but Tyrrell's lost some of its gap over McLaren. It's three points separating them. Ligier in seventh and footwork on the board in position number eight with their two points. Can they get ahead of Ligier for P number seven before this season is out? 
But the next round of the 1994 Formula One World Championship brings us to Belgium, the Belgian Grand Prix from the Spa Franco Champs circuit. One of the great Formula One circuits, drivers love it, the fans love it, great racing, high speeds, technical sections, eau rouge in an older form, so it's a little trickier to do, and uh, we definitely can't take that flat back then. Also, a new bus or an old bus stop chicane, different than the final chicane we have now, so we will take a look at those changes when we go and take a look at track when we come back in two weeks to take a look at the 1994 Belgian Grand Prix. But that's, like I said, not for two weeks. So thanks very much for joining me. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Share on social media. Follow on social media. The social media handle is Unsilent on Air. Don't forget to check out more Grand Prix too. The playlist is on the screen in the description down below. More videos to the right on YouTube.com and anywhere, anytime on the channel page. And until the next time, I'm Unsilent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>